Abraham Lincoln by Ingrid and Edgar Perrin de Alor. Uh, they are a husband wife team. They wrote all the words and they drew all the pictures. He's actually from Italy and she's from Denmark and they met in Germany and then they moved to the United States and they did a lot of wonderful books. And Grandma's going to see how many she can find. I'm going to read a portion of the book because it's kind of long. I'm going to read you about Abraham Lincoln's early years. And this is a Caldecott winner, which is kind of cool. So Abraham Lincoln, who was our 16th president. And here's a partial map of the United States. It shows Illinois and Indiana and part of Kentucky. And Abraham Lincoln in all, lived in all three big states and then moved to Washington, D.C. when he became president. Abraham Lincoln. Deep in the wilderness down in Kentucky, there stood a cabin built of roughly hewn logs. It was a poor little cabin of one room. The February wind tore at the clumsy door and made it rattle on its leather hinges. Just a glimmer of daylight sifted in through the oiled deer hide stretched across the single window frame. But the flames flickered gaily on the hearth. In this cabin lived a man named Thomas Lincoln with his wife and his little daughter Sally. And here it was that his son, Abraham Lincoln, first saw the world on a Sunday morning. It wasn't much of a house in which he was born, but it was just as good as most people had in Kentucky in 1809. So more than 200 years ago. Abe is a solemn like a papoose, said the kinfolk who came to see him. He grows so fast I can't keep him in shirts, said his father. His mother spun and sewed, and just as fast as he outgrew the old ones, she had new little Lindsay shirts ready for him, and she played with him and watched him grow while the father was busy tilling the fields. Often she took Abe to a spring nearby and sat there in a shade singing little songs and psalms to him. But the soil on the farm was meager, and father grew tired of toiling with it. I reckon we'll be moving, he said, and he bought a farm on Knob Creek on the other side of the hill. There Abe learned to help on the farm even before he had his first pair of pants. He held the tools and sat on the horse, and so Abe and his father and the horse plowed the fields together. When planting time came, his father strode in front, and Abe toddled behind, dropping the seeds. One day, the father shot a buck in the woods, and from the skin, the mother made Abe a pair of breeches, or pants. Abe stood beside her, watched every stitch she sewed. He felt very proud. Little children ran about in shirts and petticoats only, but now he would be a big boy in breeches. And Abe put on his buckskin breeches, washed his face and hands in the brook, and went off to school with his sister Sally. The road to school was two miles long. On the way, they met other children who came trotting down from the hills all about to the schoolhouse in the valley. There they sat together, big and small, reading and writing and reckoning aloud, all at one time together. There was such a clatter that it could be heard a long way off, but when Abe was six years old, he had learned both to read and write, and after that, he didn't go to school very much. Abe lived down in the valley, and up on the hill lived a boy he played with often. Between the valley and the hill ran a brook, and across the brook there lay a log. The boys had to run over that log to get together to play. One day it rained so hard the brook ran fast and the log across it was slippery. With a big splash, Abe fell head first into the water. If his friend hadn't come running and fished him out with a pole, he would have drowned. Abe's father didn't like to have neighbors too close by. Ah, uh, it's time to move when you see the smoke of your neighbor's chimney, he said one day when Abe was seven. I reckon we'll be moving. This time they traveled far, more than a hundred miles. They rode and they walked and they ferried until they left Kentucky and came to Indiana, the new state. There they borrowed a wagon and traveled on right into the wilderness. The roads became narrower and rougher, the forest darker and dense, 
At last they stopped in the midst of the woods at a place called Little Pigeon Creek. Here's where we'll build our new home, said Abe's father. While they were chopping down trees and building a shelter, the autumn sky was golden with leaves where their, for their roof. The shelter they built only had three walls, with an open hearth where the fourth wall should have been. Day and night, they had to keep the fire burning. In the corner, they put up a bed for the parents. On the ground, they spread bearskins over piles of dried leaves for Abe and Hal Al Sally to sleep on. And they unpacked the pots and pans and house food goods and settled down for the winter. When Abe and his father had cut down the timber, they plowed and planted between the tree stumps. That winter was long, but at last spring was there. There were distant neighbors who came to help build a real cabin. It had four walls, but no window or door. They had to climb through a hole in the wall to get in and out. Up under the roof, there was a loft where Abe was to sleep. Slowly, the wilderness changed into a homestead. Often, Abe and his family only had corn and potatoes to eat. But when hunting was good, the father brought game from the woods, and Abe and Sally found berries and honey. And once in a long while, the mother baked gingerbread. One day, his mother gave Abe three gingerbread men all at once. He ran out under the tree to eat them slowly all by himself. But hardly had he nibbled at the first when a fat little boy spotted him. Abe, give me a man, the little boy said, and Abe gave him the larger one. The boy crammed the whole gingerbread into his mouth. Before he had swallowed, he said, Abe, give me the other, and Abe gave him the other one, too, for he didn't know how to say no. You seem to like gingerbread men, was all he said. Abe, said the fat little boy, nobody ever loved gingerbread as much as I do, and gets so little of it. Slowly, Abe ate his one gingerbread man and wondered why the thing he liked best was always the hardest to get. He wanted to read and to study, but school was far away, and he had to stay at home to help on the farm. The heart work made him big and husky, and he could outrun and outwrestle all the boys of his age. Even quicker than his leg was his wit, so he became leader of all the boys who lived around Little Pigeon Creek. Abe hadn't much time to play, but sometimes at night, he and his friends stole out to a salt work in the woods. There they hid behind trees and watched the shy deer licking the salty slab. But Abe never went hunting as other boys in Menfolk did. He loved the animals and wouldn't harm them. For two happy years, Abe and his family lived in a home in the woods near wolves and grumbling bears. But when he was nine, a dangerous sickness came to the wilderness as his mother took sick and died. Then the woods seemed gloomy and dark, and the days grew long for Sally and Abe. A year or so later, his father went off on a trip, and for many weeks, Abe and Sally were left all alone. Then one day, in a big wagon, drawn by four horses, stopped in front of the cabin. Out of the wagon jumped their father and a kind, rosy-cheeked woman. She ran over to Abe and Sally and hugged them to her bosom. She had to come to be their new mother. The stepmother had brought her three children and all her household goods. They unloaded a chest and a table and chairs and feather beds and pots and knives and forks and spoons. So soon and fine was the furniture that Abe could run his hand over it without getting splinters in his fingers. And the stepmother climbed up to the loft where Abe slept. She threw out the leaves that had been his bedding and gave him a soft feather bed instead. She put the father to work to make a real door, a window, and a wooden floor for the cabin. She washed and scrubbed the cabin both high and low and took charge of the family right away. Let Abe have time to read, she said when she saw how eager to learn he was. At night, after the others had gone to sleep, she let him lie by the fireplace and study. In the flickering light, he practiced writing and reading. He wrote with charcoal and a wood shovel and read the Bible stories and Bible and stories about George Washington, Pilgrim's Progress, and every other book he could find. Books were scarce in the wilderness, but Abe didn't mind walking 20 miles to borrow one. When Abe grew too tired to read anymore, he climbed up the pegs in the wall to his loft. Before going to sleep, he hid the book he had been reading in a crack in the roof to keep it safe. But once a storm came up at night, and when Abe woke up, the book was soaking wet and spoiled. He had borrowed this book from a rich farmer, and for three long days, Abe had to husk corn to pay for it. 
No one can beat Abe Lincoln. That farm works of the neighbors is known far and wide how quickly quick he was at splitting logs into rail fences. For when someone passed by, he would sit on the fence he had made and talk, asking questions to learn new things. The neighbor thought he was lazy, and when he walked between the handles of the plow reading the book, they thought he was strange. Abe grew straight up in the air like a fir tree. Long and thin he was, with big hands and feet jutting out. Abe grew straight out in the air like a fir tree. Long and thin he was, with big hands and feet jutting out. His buckskin breeches were always too short and too tight. It made blue circles on his legs where they squeezed him. I can always wash your muddy feet from the floor, teased his mother, but keep your hands clean, Abe, so you won't be leaving tracks along my whitewashed ceiling. Abe grinned, scratched his head, and thought of a joke. When his stepmother went out for a while, he took a little boy with muddy feet, lifted him up, and walked him like a fly across the ceiling. Abe, I th should thrash you, said his stepmother when she came back, but she laughed at the joke instead, and with a pail of whitewash, Abe made the ceiling white and clean again. The first part of our book, Abe Lincoln. I would tell you what pages it was, but the pages aren't actually numbered in the book. But we'll read some more tomorrow about his middle years.